we're going to have a complete change of scenario and from fragile X to looking towards precision genomics and autism spectrum disorders. So I do have a financial disclosure because I'm going to talk about genetic diseases. I was a medical director for Eurofins Emory who sponsored uh, part of this event. So thank you very much to them. And what I'm going to be doing now is to give a landscape of genomics, how far we have come from the first discovery of a gene, and then talk briefly about the diagnostic workup of children with developmental delay and autism spectrum disorders, and then talk about what's precision medicine initiative and my view of what's going to be precision genomics in the future. So we as Indians are very familiar with the concept of OM, which signifies the unity of all living beings as well as all human beings. However, in the modern era, the term OM has taken on a different meaning, and this OM, O-M-E, is derived from Greek, which again signifies the entirety or the completeness in, within an organism or within a cell. So beginning with genome, which was first used in 1987 to epigenome, transcriptome, proteome, it's become very fashionable to use the term OM, and you almost get a new term every day, with the, one of the newest being exposome for inclusion of all of the things that you are exposed to in the environment. So what are some of the historical landmarks? Many people here, even though you haven't done genetics, will be familiar with Mendel's peapod experiments because you first studied about this in sixth standard. So you knew about the red flower and the white flower and the dominant and the recessive genes. So Mendel here in 1862 was the first one to actually talk about inheritance as being derived with genes. And since then, the structure of the DNA, fast forwarding, was identified in 1953 was discovered by Watson and Crick based on the X-ray crystallography model by uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And then for some of the non-geneticists in the audience and for other lay people, just a brief overview of the genetic information. We all know of genetic information as something that is passed on from our parents to the children and it is packaged in within the nucleus here in the cell, and that's packaged in chromosomes. And if we are looking at every chromosome, we can see the DNA here, which is the double helical structure. And when you look closer at the DNA, it is made up of just four base pairs or nucleotides, the adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Sets of three of these, for example, TCA, will code for one amino acid, we join together to form a protein. And that goes towards making us what we are, including the function and the structure of the human beings. So from chromosome, DNA, gene, and protein, you heard a lot about the fMR1 gene today. In terms of the gene discoveries, since the time DNA was identified, <coughs> there were a lot of diseases for which genes were identified. Huntington's disease was mapped in 1983 and then cystic fibrosis gene mutations were identified in 1989. You heard about the fragile X gene, FMR1, in 1991. And with this, scientists wanted to put the entire book, the entire genetic information together, which is the draft of the human genome. And they took about <coughs> 13 years to put this first draft together and it was published in 2003, both in Nature and in Science. With that, the Universal Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights was made, say, identifying and recognizing the inherent dignity and diversity among human beings, but essentially we are all similar, which I guess our ancients knew from the times of Bhagavad Gita or even earlier. The main goal of the Human Genome Project was thought to be to better diagnose, treat, and prevent diseases. So how far have we come from doing the first draft of the human genome to better diagnosing, treating, and preventing disease? 
I think we've been hearing a lot about the fragile X syndrome today, and that shows you how from the identification of the gene we have come towards and the progress that we have made in diagnosing, treating individuals with fragile X syndrome. So first we understood the basic structure of the genome and then identifying the fMR1 gene allowed us to know more about the function of the fMR1 gene that in turn has allowed us to devise specific treatments and improves the treatment and management of these patients. Now I'm going to be talking about what, if it, what, what does a geneticist actually do? What do they do when a child with developmental delay or intellectual disability is referred to a genetics <coughs> clinic? <coughs> developmental delay is one of the most common reasons for which a child can be referred to a genetics clinic. It's very common for almost all parents here to, you know, to have heard about my child, you know, like either brag about their children or they're really fast, they have achieved everything way faster than everybody else, or to say, you know, like somehow compared to the other sibling or to others in the population, my child is not doing as well. And we also heard a lot about how pediatricians tend not to pay too much attention to the development of the child because there is a normal variation in the population saying, oh, he's going to be okay, you know, like don't worry too much about it. So bearing in mind that developmental development has a spectrum, I think the push has been to recognize when it is outside of the normal spectrum and to identify them earlier. When a patient comes to us, we are asking more for, is there a definitive diagnosis of autism? So generally in the US, we would like for the child to have had a assessment by a developmental pediatrician to recognize whether a child falls under autism spectrum disorder or not. And then the other thing, one of the earliest signs for fragile X syndrome, Dr. Hegeman was mentioning is lack of speech. So there could be speech delay and a child may not be speaking at age two years. But speech delay could be due to various reasons and one of the first things that we need to know is whether the hearing is normal or not. So send a patient for sensory screening or a complete audiogram. Sometimes the child may be phasing out. Like somebody said, you know, like my child looks at somebody and then goes back to their iPhone. You also want to make sure if they're just phasing out that they don't have seizures, so an EEG could be done Cognitive testing can be recommended, but in very early child, I guess it's a bit difficult to do cognitive testing. However, we already heard a lot about autism and autism spectrum disorders. What is shown in green there is all the different kinds of symptoms. Being a male child, one of the risk factors for autism spectrum disorders, there could be language delay, development regression, somebody who has been doing well for some time, later on loses some of the skills. They may, a parent may come to you and say, my child is doing well until two years of age, but now he has stopped talking, so that's something to think of for autism. Uh, big brain, uh, which is usually measured by the size of the head, and seizures, GI symptoms, and then other kind of, you know, like there may be an overachieving child or very good in some aspects than in others. The rest of the things in blue here signifies the different heterogeneity in autism, which means that there are different genetic causes for autism. And in the center here, the pathophysiology of autism, which could be due to development of the neurons, the connections within the brain, which is the synaptogenesis and the neuronal or glial structure, all of these can contribute to the development of autism. So the etiology of developmental delay or autism spectrum disorder is pretty complex. There could be genetic causes, there are epigenetic causes, a lot of environmental causes, and there could be a combination of these. So when we are approaching a patient with autism, you do want to make sure that there are no treatable, easy environmental infectious causes for a developmental delay. Coming back to the genetic etiology, Nearly 30 to 40% of patients with autism spectrum disorders have an identifiable genetic cause. And then 20% of patients with intellectual disability. And you could find, you know, like variations with these as in the literature depending on what the population that was studied. 
However, when a patient comes to us for testing for developmental delay or autism spectrum disorder, the American College of Medical Genetics kind of mandates or you know like really recommends doing a chromosomal microarray or a comparative genomic hybridization test which in very simple terms looks at regions of your chromosomes which you may be missing which is a deletion or duplicated which is an <coughs> excess so instead of having two copies you could have just one copy within a region of a chromosome or you could have more than two copies and then the second thing of course fragile X, it's the most common cause for intellectual disability in males and also for autism spectrum disorders. And from this conference, I have been learning that we need to be thinking more about doing fragile X testing even for females who may have autism spectrum disorders because of, you know, like pre mutation and other things. And the other um, causes would be rubella titers if there is a cause for infection, standard metabolic screening. In the US, all children are getting um, newborn screening for a number of metabolic conditions. Whereas over here, I know it's limited in certain centers only, but if you suspect there could be a metabolic cause, definitely metabolic screening should be done. The other group is the urine mucopolysaccharides, which is for lysosomal storage disorders. And then organic acid comes under metabolic. You may think of doing other markers like serum lactate for mitochondrial disorders, amino acids, serum ammonia level or acyl carnitine profile, which all come under the metabolic conditions. However, the key person is still the clinician because you're the person who is seeing the patients and you're the one who's going to be ordering the testing, right? So if you see an individual come in with history of developmental delay and this kind of an appearance, uh, would anybody want to think, think of a diagnosis for this particular individual? You know, like if you look at him, he's got prominent ears, maybe large. Um, large ears and then, uh, you know, like uh, slightly bent nose and uh, also has congenital heart defects, has hypocalcemia, 22Q11.2 deletion, absolutely. So in this instance, you know, like you won't be thinking of sending a metabolic testing or you won't be thinking of sending in testing for fragile X. Although, you know, if you look at the facial appearance, one may think of this could be fragile X. So going on from your first impression, all you need to do is ask the family history, right? If you have a family history of an affected uncle or, you know, like grandfather who may have developed some of the symptoms, then you may direct your testing towards fragile X. So as clinicians really still play a very important role in deciding what kind of testing I would want to do. And this is 22Q11.2 deletion which can be identified by a chromosomal microarray analysis or FISH for 22 cures. So and then two other children here. If uh, the first child there has a large head size, also has come with autism spectrum disorder or developmental delay, um, and then the second child has got a smaller head size, and you can see she likes to play with her hands. So, Red syndrome, absolutely. So for the girl child, the sex also plays an important role. And for the girl child, you are right away thinking about red syndrome with microcephaly and the hand movements. And for the other child with larger head size and, you know, like very cute looking, relatively non-dysmorphic child, you'd be thinking of, I know lots of people are nodding their heads saying Peyton related macrocephaly and autism spectrum disorder. So in, you won't go for a chromosome <coughs> microarray, you will not go for a fragile X testing, you'd go directly for fetal gene testing or red syndrome, MECP2 gene testing targeted. So for genetic testing, we have the option of doing a single gene testing. If you are very sure about your diagnosis or if you're fairly sure about your clinical impression, then we have what's called as the next generation sequencing analysis where you can put multiple genes on the same panel and if you don't have a very clear clinical phenotype, then you can do next generation sequencing analysis. And then we have exome analysis. What's an exome analysis? Another exome, right? So that's looking at all the exons in the body, which is about around 19,000 genes, which is what the humans are estimated to carry. You can do all of them at once. 
However, going forward, the cost of the genetic testing is coming down rapidly. It went from millions of dollars in 13 years to now it's thousand dollars. It's on sale now, honestly. We are in the sale for human genome sequencing. So should you just be doing genome testing and get everybody with one test? Would the geneticists in the room do it? Yes. No? Okay. And why not? So we'll talk about that a little bit. So what's a precision medicine initiative? What is it? We are all not alike. We don't wear the same size shoes. We don't wear the same size clothes. However, medicine traditionally has been the same for every single one of us. Yet we know that we are all different. So the Precision Medicine Initiative is more of a personalized medicine based on maybe your genome, would we be able to tailor your treatment to an individual? So there has been a lot of initiatives, and when I was looking up, I know there's an initiative in India as well to do the genomics for understanding rare diseases with the India Alliance Network, and they are um, looking for samples, if anybody is interested in sending, to do whole genome studies for gene discovery and identification. So when are large-scale genomic studies indicated? When you have a rare Mendelian disease, because you know, like those are very rare, so if you just look at one person, you may not uh, understand much. Could this be used for newborn screening? Can we use this for prenatal testing? Or we can do a study by looking at large number of individuals from hospitals where we've already collected data, right? So we can go back and look at some of the uh, results retrospectively to see if there could be any associations. And there have been a number of initiatives around the world, including in the US, India, China, Japan, and various places. So the, keep that in mind, and we'll discuss further why it should not be used for a patient. The next thing I want to bring about is the patient's view towards healthcare decision making. We already have seen, and this is a very good example of how parents are taking the health of their child into their own hands and making organization. In one of the studies which was done by Medscape, most patients, like 70% of the patients, would like their healthcare professional to explain the things to them, and then they would like to review their own options of what kind of a treatment they want. About 20% of them said they will do their own research on Google and maybe tell the healthcare professionals what to do. And then discuss the professional with the professional what needs to be done. The only about 10% of them really wanted you to be very direct to you as to this is what I think is good for you and this is what you're going to be doing. So that population is dwindling. We are going away, moving away from I'm the doctor and I know what's best for you, you listen to me and you're going to be doing that. So we all need to be cognizant of the changes, especially with advances in electronic media and then you know like in the ease with which somebody can Google what they have wherever they are in the world. So with all of these advances and if you have a genome done, you could have patients coming to you with their genome on their iPhones or smartphones and ask you for analysis. What's the problem though? What would we be seeing? I have an example here of a test result from a patient who had next generation sequencing analysis. When they looked at even 80 genes, we don't have a definite answer here because what it's showing is three different genes. The name of the gene is COL, call 11A1, LRP5, and MNP6, and then it shows the <coughs> exon number. The nucleotide change is the next one, which is the numbering uh, C5198G2A, and then it changes the amino acid. Remember the nucleotide codes for the protein or the amino acid? So it changes one of the amino acids. R stands for an arginine at position 1733. Heterozygous means it is present on just one copy of the gene. And then the type is VOUS. What does VOUS mean? That's really the bane of the existence of molecular geneticists and clinical geneticists. And why do I say that? Variant of unknown significance means 
honestly we don't know a damn thing about what this particular chain mm -hmm. means so which means we really don't know what it means and we have done all this test and we are still at this position where we are saying you know like we don't know a damn thing about this we are still back to square one right and for this patient or for this person if they have spent a lot of money like five thousand dollars or in equivalent terms thirty thousand rupees or thirty two thousand rupees and you're still back to square one mm -hmm. if just mm -hmm. doing targeted genetic test can you can end up with a result like this which is not giving you a positive test result or a negative test result imagine if you do a genome where you have three billion nucleotides to look at and how much of variations you have so that really is the dark matter and the darkness that we really don't know when we're doing the genetic testing. So when in one of the studies where they did the genome analysis, this was the headlines saying genetic testing fumbles revealing the dark side of precision medicine. So what do we mean by it? When you do a genetic test and you find a variant which we really don't know is causing a disease, you can go in and do treatment. For example, in this particular instance, there was a gene mutation that was identified, which was known to cause a heart block. So based on the result, the patient's family went in and got a, a pacemaker done. And then more studies revealed that it's not really a mutation, but a common variant among the population. So now you have taken a normal pa person and put a pacemaker based on a genetic test result. We don't want to do that, right? First, do no harm. So that's like the dark matter and genetic testing is not really, uh, you know, like the end result of uh, all testing. So we are going to get a lot of data and we need a lot of computational help, like the binary code to decipher our quaternary code of the genomic information and big data analysis, everybody has heard about that. So why do we still want to do genetic testing? Well, I think we heard a lot from the FM, FMR1 gene testing or the fragile X, why it will, how it will help in providing accurate genetic counseling, how it can affect a lot of family members. You can give more clear prognosis to the families, helps in risk assessment. For example, a person can go in and have prenatal testing and get appropriate services. So, we do need a definitive diagnosis for everyone, but while we are still learning, we need to exercise caution. It will help in parent education and training, social skills training, and you know, like really directing your patient towards what needs to be done. That's why we are still wanting you all to do genetic testing. And with that, I would like to acknowledge Shalini and all of the other families in the Fragile X Society who have really come together to bring awareness for the Fragilex. And I would like to thank Dr. Asha Vera, my mentor here, and Dr. Randy Hegerman from Mind Institute, Robbie, who is there, who came to my office several times to try and get all of this organization and the symposium going. And finally, thank you all for your attention. I would like to point out that most of us live in the clouds here, not just the kids with their iPhones, so I think we do need to come off of the clouds sometime to be living in the real world, uh, to enjoy life on the earth, I think. And with that, thank you all for your attention. Uh, uh, we will have no question answer session as there is a paucity of time. Would like to announce our next speaker. I'll be there later on too, so you know, like if you